In 1944, as the major powers of the world moved toward the climax of the most horrific war in human history, the British rulers of India released Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Gandhi emerged frighteningly emaciated suffering from malaria, hookworm, anemia, and dark despair. The intent of his movement was to convince Britain that they could no longer rule India and should leave. Its intent was to show that India was already free, a self-reliant people creating a diverse, tolerant, non-violent society. I feel in the inmost recesses of my heart that the world is sick unto death of blood spilling. The world is seeking a way out and I flatter myself with the belief that perhaps it will be a privilege of the ancient land of India to show that way out to the hungering world. During Quit India, 100,000 unarmed demonstrators filled the jails and prisons. Over a thousand were shot and killed. Schools and factories closed. Taxes went unpaid. Trains stopped. While incarcerated, the two most important people in Gandhi's life died in his arms. Kasturba, his wife, mother of his four sons, and leader of the freedom movement in her own right, who had become known as the mother of India. And Mahadev Desai, his personal secretary for 25 years and closest associate. Gandhi had also endured a 21-day fast, which almost killed him. He was 73. Upon his release, Britain remained the occupier of India. Uh, so undoubtedly, he asks himself, is, uh, was Quit India a mistake? Was my whole life a mistake? Uh, was my whole truth an error? So I think questions like that possibly entered his mind. There were periods. Uh, when his associate Pyarilal secretary would speak of his of his depression and his of the light almost going out, the British Viceroy of India, Archibald Wavell, convinced Prime Minister Winston Churchill that the one the world called Mahatma, or Great Soul, was near death and could no longer be a threat to the empire. The last thing Britain wanted was for Gandhi to die in prison. Better that he die outside. He had been born in a seaside town and loved the sea. To heal, Gandhi went first to Juhu Beach near Bombay. He then traveled to a spa in the mountains above Pune, a city in which he had been imprisoned several times. In less than three months, the Mahatma was again moving all of India to manifest his dream. Churchill expressed outrage that he was still alive at all. The political landscape had changed. India was about to undergo a nightmare of birth. Gandhi's greatest concern was coming true. Encouraged by Britain's strategy of divide and rule, India was fracturing into fearful Muslim and Hindu conclaves, far removed from the society of peaceful diversity for which he had struggled. Thousands of leaders of his Congress party, which reflected the nonviolent methods of its leader, remained in prison. He would never 
regain the influence he once had with them. They were there for three years, three, and they were getting old. And they felt very agitated, very restless. So next time, if, when we are out, if we are out, and Gandhi has other ideas, we will think twice before accepting his ideas. Not in prison was Vindyak Savarkar. Gandhi met him in the early 1900s at a London residence for radicalized Indian students. Both were scheduled to speak. Gandhi espoused the power of nonviolence to change the heart of the enemy. Savarkar spoke of assassination as the path to independence. In a shed behind the house, he and his followers collected weapons and made bombs. Alarmed, Gandhi devoted sections of his classic book, Hinswaraj, to answering Savakar. You want to make the holy land of India unholy? Do you not tremble to think of freeing India by assassinations? What we need to do is to sacrifice ourselves. It is a cowardly thought that of killing others. Whom do you suppose to free by assassination? The millions of India do not desire it. Those who are intoxicated by the wretched modern civilization think these things. Savakar spent over a decade in British prisons, promising that he would never oppose the empire again. He was released. Instead, he became an ardent advocate of India as a Hindu nation for Hindus. He became the spokesperson and resident philosopher for the Mahasabha, an assembly of Orthodox Hindus, and he turned his ire upon the Muslims. He urged young Hindus to enlist in World War II and learn the art of killing necessary to disempower the Muslims of India. Representing Islam was Muhammad Ali Jinnah, president for life of the Muslim League. He had declared the intention to establish a Muslim nation on the Indian subcontinent, Pakistan. Jinnah had no qualms about Muslims fighting for the Allies. A delighted Churchill had given him his private phone number. In September 1944, Gandhi met many times with Jinnah and employed all his persuasive powers to hold India together. He understood the carnage which would occur with partition. Most of India's 700,000 villages consisted of Muslims and Hindus living side by side in peace. These conflicts were being solved by a failing British Empire, which now wanted to divide and rule. After all, it was the 1911 census in which they made you either a Muslim or a Hindu, because before that people would put Hindu Muslim. Practicing both faiths, Sufism was the practice of our land. Um, so many people felt they were Hindu and Muslim at the same time, and the saints they followed were Hindu and Muslim at the same time. Um, in Punjab, Hindu and Sikh. Family's oldest son will be a Sikh, the others will be Hindu. Uh, and there is a very clear attempt to create division along religious lines to justify or eclipse processes of domination. Jinnah had only to point to Savakar's followers as proof that Muslims would not be safe in a Hindu majority India. Their talks failed. Gandhi called off Quit India at the end of the war and the jails emptied. The events moved rapidly toward independence and the partition of India and Pakistan. Negotiating sessions were held in the British Himalayan Summer Palace in Simla. In its vast halls, Jinnah won his Pakistan. 
Disastrously, Pakistan would consist of two parcels of land at opposite ends of the Indian subcontinent, separated by over 2,000 kilometers, with India in between. Gandhi attended the final meeting. Hindu and Muslim leaders argued over power sharing in an interim government. Gandhi walked out telling them that he had failed in his life's mission. A disagreement between Jinnah and Nehru, India's future prime minister, caused Jinnah to decree a Muslim direct action day across the subcontinent. He made a point of saying that it would not be constrained by nonviolence. So far, the British had their guns. The Congress had the gun of civil disobedience. Now we also have a pistol. This is how we put it. But then, you know, we can understand it, but to the masses of India at the time, I have to say this non question of nonviolence are irrelevant to talk about pistols. It ignited a holocaust of Hindus killing Muslims and Muslims killing Hindus, which would only end with Gandhi's assassination 18 months later. The total number slaughtered in what would come to be known as the Great Killing and Great Migration will never be known. Some estimates run higher than a million. In his new role as outcast from the political decision makers, Gandhi, now 77, decided on a small action for peace, which he prayed would show everyone the way out of the gathering conflagration. He went to the remote villages of Noakali in what would soon be East Pakistan. The pilgrimage would become known to some as the miracle of Noah Kali. Gandhi's work for religious harmony came out of his deeper sense that humans have the potential to be compassionate. Humans don't have an intrinsic commitment to hate and violence, that we cultivate love for each other, love for the respect of diversity, the recognition that diversity is the context of harmony, whether it's in nature or it's in societies. The snows of the Himalayas melt and flood the green wetlands of Noakali with thousands of streams and rich organic pools then flow softly to the Bay of Bengal. Hundreds of villages enliven these wetlands. The densely populated forest was 80% Muslim and 20% Hindu. As the interreligious slaughter spread, Hindu homes and temples were looted and burned. Women were raped and forced to convert to Islam. Bodies littered the paths. Walking barefoot, like an ancient sadhu doing penance, Gandhi set out with a small team. We don't go into our mosques, temples or churches with shoes on. We tread on holy ground where people have lost loved ones. How can we wear sandals there? He would walk 165 miles and bring the message of peace to 47 villages. As a message to the Mahatma, feces were thrown onto his path. Banners hung from trees greeting him with threats. Leave, you have been warned, and accept Pakistan. Given his lifelong commitment to relieve the oppression of so-called untouchables, Gandhi grabbed fallen branches and did their work, sweeping the way clean before proceeding. 
there would be no more orchestration of millions into mass movements. His experiment in truth in Noah Kali was that by self-purification and interacting with both perpetrators and victims in unconditional love, peace would come. When I am a perfect being, I will have to simply say the word and the nation will listen. I want to attain that perfection by service. He had uh, a, a fear of walking across the bridges of Noakali, which were a symbol of walking across the, uh, the violence of the region itself, very slippery bridges uh, in watery areas, um, high off the ground. and. Uh, <laughs> Gandhi couldn't do it. Uh, he had to, you know, he had to have the help of other people to get across these bridges. So he's, he he decided, I'm just going to practice, and he practiced and he practiced. And eventually, he could walk across these bridges. At the same time, as he was walking into these neighborhoods where uh, the ruins were smoldering, the the corpses were on the ground, the the bones, the charred bones were left and right, and uh, he was praying constantly and bowing to the, to, the, um, to the people responsible for all of this, as well as to the victims, to bring them together. The way of truth is lined with skeletons over which we dare to walk. Sleeping only three or four hours a night, he began each day singing a poem by the great Bengal poet Rabindranath Tagore. Ekla Chalo. The closing lines are, If they shut the doors and do not hold up the light when the night is troubled with storm, O thou unlucky one, with the thunder flame of pain, ignite your heart and let it burn alone. At every point, Gandhi said, you've got to take that step and you've got to take that first step knowing that your first step will change the context for everyone else's first step the more i go about in these parts the more i find that your worst enemy is fear the terrorist as well as the terrorized is equally its victim it eats into their vitals Unless you cultivate fearlessness, there will never be any peace in these parts for the Hindus or for the Muslims. Fear, always fear. Fear of the British Empire, fear of the, um, the white man, fear of the enemy, whether it be the Muslim fearing the Hindu or the Hindu fearing the Muslim and Gandhi became fearless. Take a pledge with God and your own conscience as witness that you will no longer rest till freedom is achieved and will be prepared to lay down your lives in the attempt to achieve it. From the beginning in South Africa, when he introduced Satyagraha to the world, as the non-violent way to overcome the oppressor with truth. He had maintained that the most effective death for a satyagrahi was to suffer and die in service to truth. The power of his movement was built upon it. Sabarmate, the ashram from which he launched the Salt March in 1930, had been built on land that bordered a prison on one side and a crematorium on the other. It was clear now that his own death would come not to gain independence from Britain, which he had thought would quit India and its mantra of do or die. It would come to stop the hatred among his own people. More and more, those close to Gandhi noticed that he spoke of his imminent demise. Don't you see? I am mounted on a funeral pyre. You should know that it is a corpse that is telling you this. In India, 
the deeper love and the deeper compassion is expressed through sacrifice. That's why the fire sacrifice is always there, everywhere, all the time. At the age of 18, in an odd flash of prophecy while voyaging to England to study law, Gandhi had informed his cabin mate that one day he would die at the hand of a Hindu. He knew as he went into this darkness uh, through his nonviolent commitment that he was going to be um, assassinated. It's a process that any prophet begins to realize. And so the art of dying um, was the art of living nonviolently and not responding with violence to anyone who was um, uh, beating him up or in the end killing him uh, as a number of people tried to do persistently throughout his life. So the art of dying was, was that, but it was also <clears throat> the art of dying daily. By the end of the Noah Kali pilgrimage, the killing had stopped. Muslim leaders and fighters emerged from the forests to lay down their weapons and promise Gandhi they would protect Hindus with their lives. Abducted women and looted possessions were returned. Desecrated temples and toppled Hindu statues were raised. I was there uh, oh, 50 plus years after the, the, the incident. And I went there and I arrived unannounced and I met, I stopped people as they were walking and asked, interviewed dozens of them. And they all recalled the events as if it was the previous day. It was so fresh on their minds. They said, yes, there was this old man and there were this other, his associates, these women with him. And uh, yes, he, he uh, recited the Quran. Uh, he um, asked us to live together. Uh, and uh, so many of them also said that he tried to cure my illness, he gave me some fruit, he gave me some medicines. And so this great leader who was on the world stage is now very much a simple village level worker and trying to understand the ordinary person's life and trying to be of such assistance as he could. In those years, African-American civil rights leaders had begun to look to India and Gandhian nonviolence as an answer to American apartheid. One such leader, William Stuart Nelson, dean of the Howard University School of Religion, walked with Gandhi in Noah Kali. In the cool of the evenings, each absorbed the dreams and tribulations of the other. On December 25th, 1946, Gandhi asked Nelson to lead a Christian hymn at prayers. What a wonderful picture. It's Christmas Day in a Muslim majority area. There are Muslims and, and Hindus in the audience. Gandhi the Hindu and this black American is uh, singing a Christian song and Gandhi is translating it for these Hindus and Muslims. 30,000 Muslims and Hindus attended Gandhi's final prayer meeting in Shampur, Bengal. He then made the water crossing of what would soon be the border between Pakistan and India. He was on his way to Bihar, where instead of Muslims killing Hindus, Hindus were killing Muslims in revenge for the killings in Bengal. And in Noah Kali, violence returned. Gandhi planned to spend Independence Day there, restoring the peace. But the road to Noah Kali ran through Calcutta. Gandhi, the nonviolent general par excellence, who meticulously carried out well-laid plans, was now at the mercy of a tsunami of violence. He stopped as usual 
at the Sodapur spinning ashram on the outskirts of the great city. City leaders came to beg him to stay. The Calcutta massacre of direct action day might be nothing compared to the slaughter that could accompany independence and partition. The one who convinced him was Shahid Surawadi, known to Hindus as the Butcher of Calcutta. Shahid Surawadi was regarded as the author of the, the massacre in, in, um, in Calcutta. Uh, that took so many Hindu lives. Gandhi uh, reached out to that man, he, who is regarded as the, the worst possible person in the whole region, uh, the Muslim um, killer. Gandhi told Surawardi that he would remain in Calcutta on one condition. The two of them must live together in the same house. It was dangerous business. Surawadi is the great devil. They attack him, they physically attack the place, they break the doors, they break the windows. Gandhi almost gets killed. You want to force me to leave this place, but you should know that I have never submitted to force. It is contrary to my nature. I put it to you, young man, how can I who am a Hindu by birth, a Hindu by creed, and a Hindu of Hindus in my way of living, be an enemy of Hindus. Surawardi uh, suddenly became Gandhi's apostle of, of, of unity. It was a, a transformation. With Surawardi at his side, on August 14th, the eve of independence, Gandhi spoke to an estimated half million peaceful Hindus and Muslims. A free India would begin at midnight. Gandhi fasted, spun, and dictated letters of peace and goodwill to friends around the world. He asked to be driven anonymously around the city. He saw no violence but cautioned that what people were calling the miracle of Calcutta had happened too quickly. The peace would hold for only two weeks. Then, with an incident reportedly manufactured by members of the Mahasapa, the cycle of revenge began again. On September 1st, at 3 a.m., Gandhi woke his aides to tell them that he had begun a fast unto death. My fast isolates the forces of evil. The moment they are isolated, they die, for evil by itself has no life. After four days, a delegation from all sides of the conflict gathered at his bedside and pled for him to end the fast. He asked them to pledge together that they would protect the peace with their lives. They agreed unanimously. Gandhi broke his fast. The situation is, is controlled. Um, and uh, there's no doubt that this played a, a large part in the fact that the terrible, terrible killings that took place in Punjab and some other parts of northern India did not take place in Calcutta. As he prepared to leave, a group of young people, calling themselves the Peace Brigade, vowed to put their lives on the line and stand in nonviolent resistance to further rioting between Hindus and Muslims. They asked Gandhi to leave them a message. Gandhi responded, My life is my message. Well, Gandhi had this audacity. You know, I mean, how many people can say, my life is my message? I mean, it takes a lot of cheek to say that. <laughs> Most of us would say, my life is not my message. My message is much greater than my poor, weak, terrible life. But this man has the guts to say, my life is my message.
He puts his life on the line. The killing had been horrific in the Punjab on the other side of the subcontinent, which, like Bengal, had been sliced in two. Gandhi determined to go there next. But again, the terrible winds of communal bloodshed swept him to a different shore, and this time, the end of his journey. On September 9, 1947, he planned only a stopover in Delhi. From the moment he stepped off the train, Gandhi knew something was terribly wrong. His old friend, now Deputy Prime Minister Vallabhai Patel, met him at the station and was subdued, tense. As always, Gandhi wanted to reside in the ghetto, relegated to the untouchables, the lowest of the low in the Hindu caste system. Uh, but uh, Patel uh, was in charge of security for the country, and, and for Gandhi too, uh, said that it would be difficult to uh, protect Gandhi if he stayed with the untouchables. Uh, but of course, it was at Birla House that he was killed. Patel disclosed the explosion of violence five days earlier. Arson, looting, rioting, sniping. Minority Muslims driven from their homes and thousands killed. Bodies strewn in the streets. Patel, the practitioner of Gandhian nonviolence, had ordered a policy of shoot to kill. I heard enough to warn me that I must not leave Delhi until it had regained its former self. I must apply the old formula, do or die, to the capital of India. Within 24 hours, Gandhi visited five refugee camps. Two with displaced Muslims huddled fearfully and three overcrowded with Hindus and Sikhs who had fled their homes in West Punjab and East Bengal, now in Pakistan. Many of the refugees had trudged hundreds of miles, losing loved ones along the way to cholera and other epidemics. Some had survived terrifying journeys as trains were ambushed and passengers slaughtered. Gandhi became a focus for their despair. Crowds screamed, go back, as he walked among them. He interrogated the RSS chief about that paramilitary organization's role in fomenting violence. All of India was now his audience. Patel arranged for his daily prayer meetings to be broadcast on all India radio. Millions listened as he faced down hecklers who objected to the Quran being read with other sacred texts. Uh, I was often seated quite close to him. Uh, might say facing everybody else, including these ob objectors and protesters. And um, so often the thought would cross my mind, uh, what would happen if these people were to come close to him and punch him or hit him or attack him or try to kill him? Would I be able to be of any assistance to him or not? To me, this uh, ability on his part to be fairly cordial to those who were quite angry with him or even hostile to him and reasoning with them, and yet not yielding his ground, not being intimidated by them, and not being enraged by them. Uh, so this was one of my lasting memories. Jesus Christ prayed to God from the cross to forgive those who had crucified him. It is my constant prayer to God that he may give me strength to intercede even for my assassin. Uh, people say that they love him, they call him the father of the nation, but he also knows that they are intensely dissatisfied. The Hindus want something, the Muslims want something, the Sikhs want something. And so there are these swirls of real anger and hatred surrounding him. So 
even objectively, he, he doesn't need some kind of intuition. Uh, he, he can see that there are these people ready to end his life. I have become bankrupt. I have no say with my people. I pray to God day and night that he should take me away or he should give me the power to extinguish this fire. I do not wish another birthday to overtake me in an India still in flames. So those are very tough days, you know, this time when I was often with him. Was the time of India's partition of the violence, of sadness, of people coming in complaining to him, Hindus and Sikhs complaining to him, Muslims complaining to him. Uh, and yet, whenever uh, I was with him, or my siblings and I were with him, he was chuckling away, he was teasing us, we were teasing him. He gave a warm embrace, uh, he gave a slap on the back as his form of greeting. Uh, so it was, he, 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 he certainly was uh, bubbling all this. In early January, Muslim friends came and asked Gandhi to help them go to England, where they would feel safer. And a letter arrived from a veteran freedom fighter complaining of the corruption of Gandhi's Congress party. People were murmuring, he wrote, that the British government was much better. Calling these matters too shocking for words, Gandhi made a decision he had been brooding over. On January 13th, an announcement was read by his physician. The 78-year-old had begun a fast until death, or until the madness in Delhi ended. So the fast as an offering of oneself calls attention to the larger issues at stake. And basically it's a declaration, I'm willing to sacrifice myself for harmony between religions, come and join me. And that is the wake-up call. Those who would create disharmony get touched. Those who are t treating it indifferently realize they have to join. And that's how his fasts, as a sacrifice of himself, for love for the greater common good, was a, were a constant call to the nation. Thousands across India fasted along with the Mahatma. On the second night, lying on his fasting bed in the darkened veranda, he heard a commotion outside. It was an angry demonstration. There were cries that, uh, of people who wanted to let him die. Gandhi heard the cries from within, and he just said, Rama, 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 prayed on his bed uh, for those people. On the third day, his doctors announced that Gandhi's kidneys were failing. This was proof of his inadequate faith in God, he told them. Not a reason to end the fast. People began to march, Hindus and Muslims, together through the streets and, and again to surrender weapons. And uh, at a point where um, they were begging him um, in his delirium from his fast to, to end it, um, the, the marches reached a point, and especially where Hindu Mahasabha people came in and said, please, Gandhi, we too will, will commit to coming together. Um, then he said, yes, I, I can. On January 18th, leaders from the Mahasabha and RSS stood alongside the Muslim High Commissioner of Pakistan at Gandhi's bedside. Interfaith prayers were sung. The violence had completely stopped. Gandhi asked for a glass of orange juice. Those across India fasting with him partook of nourishment. Gandhi's prestige was at its apex globally. The British News Chronicle noted the success of Mahatma Gandhi's fast demonstrates a power which may prove greater than the atom bomb at which the West should watch with envy and hope. What did it achieve? According to some people, 
if Gandhi had not been in Delhi at that time and not conducted that fast, it was perfectly possible that all the Muslims of Delhi would have been expelled. It was perfectly possible that India would have declared itself a Hindu state rather than a state for all Indians. So the fact that today Delhi is a city for all and Delhi's ancient Islamic monuments are still there and that India is, is, is not a, a Hindu nation but a nation for everybody living there is intimately connected to Gandhi's final fast. Athuram Godse was determined to stop any more meddling by the Mahatma. Godse had been a member of both the RSS and Mahasabha. He was a disciple of Vinyak Savarkar, traveled with him, stayed in his home. He believed with Savarkar that Gandhi had weakened pure Hinduism through non-violence and compromise with the enemies of Hinduism. Gandhi's sympathy for Muslims deeply offended him. With six conspirators, Godsi traveled to Delhi and went to Gandhi's prayer meeting. The, the attempt to assassinate Gandhi on January 20th, 1948, was uh, with a group of men who were Savarkar's disciples. Uh, they had been blessed by him in uh, Bombay, and they uh, set it up in such a way that there would be a, an explosion to distract people at Gandhi's prayer meeting uh, by one man and the others would be prepared to hurl hand grenades and fire guns at Gandhi. Um, it was overkill and it failed. The bomb to distract people uh, went off. Uh, Gandhi was totally peaceful and what the uh, assailants had hoped would be um, a diversion so that they could uh, then uh, rush at Gandhi, kill him, and in the chaos of the crowd, uh, escape. Uh, none of that happened. <laughs> One man was captured, um, the others melted away into the crowd, and the one man confessed to the entire plot, thereby identifying his co-conspirators. The authorities made no attempt to pursue the would-be assassins. Gandhi's response to the whole thing was, uh, to um, hope that people would, uh, first of all, not uh, blame that one man who had been captured. With an accomplice, Godsey fled to Bombay after the botched murder attempt and held a final meeting with Savarkar. Witnesses reported Savarkar instructed them to be successful and return. He predicted Gandhi would see no more birthdays. There are some Muslims he meets every day in Delhi. Every day. He tells them, I want you to pray that if I'm killed, that I will forgive my assailant. So he wants not only himself to have this freedom of hatred for his assailant, he wants the Muslims also to forgive the Hindu killer of future Hindu kingdom, and, and vice versa. So he's uh, trying to teach uh, not just the uh, power of uh, death for truth, or that it could be a useful thing at times. He's also uh, establishing forgiveness as, as, as a value. On the day before, and the day of his death, Gandhi drafted a new constitution for his Congress party. It would disband the organization and transform it into a People's Servants Association. Members would work to cure illiteracy, unemployment, untouchability, and intolerance. Congress officials would live in the villages not the palatial homes of Delhi. He also met with 40 Hindus who had survived the most recent train massacre. They took out their anger on him. One of them said, 
I had done enough harm already and that I should stop and disappear from the scene. He did not care whether I was a Mahatma. I asked him where he wanted me to go. He said that I might go to the Himalayas. I want to find peace in the midst of turmoil or I want to die in the turmoil. My Himalayas are here. He awoke early on the morning of January the 30th, even for Gandhi, and oddly complained about the darkness surrounding him. An aide offered him a dose of penicillin for his cough. If I were to die of disease or even a pimple, you must shout to the world from the housetops that I was a false Mahatma. Then my soul, wherever it may be, will rest in peace. But if an explosion took place or somebody shot at me and I received his bullets on my bare chest, without a sigh and with Rama's name on my lips, only then you should say, I was a true Mahatma. In his morning prayer, he asked for complete absolution. Forgive, O merciful and loving God of gods, all my sins of hand or foot, body or speech, eye or ear, of commission or omission. I ask neither for a kingdom, nor for a heaven, nor for liberation, but only for an end to the pain of the suffering ones. Gandhi emerged from Birla House into a bright, cool afternoon for evening prayers. He passed well-tended gardens, fragrant with flowers and melodic with birdsong. He heard the reverential murmur of the hundreds who had gathered. Assisted on either side by his grandniece Manu Gandhi and Abba Gandhi, his grandniece by marriage, he mounted the steps to the long lawn leading to the dais where he would sit. He jokingly chided his relatives about being late. The three fell silent as usual and concentrated on God as they reached the top of the stairs. Gandhi raised his hands and returned the greeting of Namaste. Almost immediately, Godsey pushed forward and shoved Manu aside. He seemed to kneel briefly at the Mahatma's feet, then came up with a revolver and shot Gandhi three times in the chest at near point-blank range. Witnesses testified that as he fell, Gandhi uttered the name of God twice. Ram, Ram, as he had hoped that he would. There would be no more words. Abba cradled his head at her lap as he fell. Mohandas Karamchan Gandhi was dead. The strongest uh, impression I have is of the feeling of a loss by everybody. Uh, not for a moment did I feel that it was a family bereavement. <laughs> that thought never crossed, crossed my mind. Yes, I knew it was my grandfather who had been killed, but everybody was weeping in, in grief that somebody very close to them had, had been killed. So that understanding that everybody was sharing this loss absolutely bowled me over. So I walked with, along with all these hundreds of thousands of people to this place where his body was cremated. And then a day or two thereafter, uh, uh, as is the Hindu practice, the male descendants of the deceased uh, collect the bones from the... So, uh, that is, of course, a strong memory uh, in me. 
God is a uh, martyrdom prevented the, um, the genocide from continuing between the Hindus and the Muslims. It, it, it ended the, the terrible, terrible killing uh, that was going on from the partition of India and Pakistan, confirmation of, um, of reality, a confirmation of transformation, of redemption, through um, love, through death, we have to die. The seed has to go down in order for the, you know, the, the, the tree and the fruit to come forth. One death willingly accepted with forgiveness for the assassin. In the name of God, in your heart and on your lips. made India a different country. I can see that in the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence I gather that God is life, truth, light. He is love. He is the supreme good. But He is no God who merely satisfies the intellect, if he ever does. God, to be God, must rule the heart and transform it. Although Gandhi's effort to create a new civilization of egalitarian, self-reliant communities at peace has yet to be achieved, the ideas, ideals, and values he introduced have become a common path for the nonviolent liberation of oppressed peoples and those seeking a way through our global crises of the 21st century. In the 40 years following India's struggle for freedom, 47 nations gained independence from Great Britain, which at once held power over 25% of the earth. In 1971, East Pakistan, including Noah Kali, fought a war of independence against West Pakistan, won, and became Bangladesh. To this day, the Mahasabha celebrate January the 30th, the anniversary of Gandhi's murder. Nathuram Godse is praised as a martyr, and the followers of Savarkar are as certain as ever that India will one day be a Hindu state. Against the objections of the Gandhi family, Nathuram Godse and co-conspirator Narayan Apti were hung. The remaining accomplices were sentenced to life in prison, one later acquitted upon appeal. Vinyak Savakar was set free due to lack of evidence. Only one witness was introduced at trial linking him to the murder. Two were required under Indian law. There were other witnesses, and 15 years later, a government commission found Savakar complicit in Gandhi's assassination. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the father of Pakistan, survived Gandhi by only five months, dying of tuberculosis, a condition he kept secret for many years. Are you prepared to return to jail again? I am always prepared to return to jail. <laughs> uh, would you be prepared to die in the cause of India's independence.